I made a short sale once that worked out well. Charlie, Charlie and I are no strangers to short selling. I mean, we both failed at it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you go back far enough, you know, we did a reasonable amount of short selling, and I've certainly identified lots of country, companies that I thought were far overpriced, and I've identified a fair number of companies that I not only thought, but was virtually, I was virtually certain were frauds, and so Charlie, I mean, we've, we've been seeing them ever since we got in the business, but making a lot of money short selling still uh, is, not a, uh, is not a game that appeals to us over a long period of time. It's one of those things that, that uh, we don't like trading agony for money. We shorted out the general market um, for about five years in the partnership to a degree. We borrowed stocks directly from some major universities. I think we were probably quite early in that. We went to Columbia and Harvard and Chicago and different places and actually arranged for direct borrowing. There weren't the, it wasn't as easy to facilitate in those days as it is now. And so we would, we would take their portfolios and we would just say, give us any of the stocks you want to and, we're, and then we'll return them to you after a while and we'll pay you a little fee. And then we went long things that we thought were attractive. We did not go short things that we thought were unattractive. We just shorted out the market generally. It was not a big deal, but it, we probably made some, some extra money out in the 60s. It's not something that would fit our, what we do these days at all. And generally speaking, I think if you got some very good ideas on, on businesses that are undervalued, it's really unnecessary to do any shorting out of the market. We made our money by being long some wonderful businesses. We didn't make it by a long short strategy. There have always been hundreds of cases or thousands of cases of, of things that are ridiculously priced. That, that's always gone on and always will go on. and. It doesn't make any difference to us. I mean, we, we are not trying to predict markets. We never will try and predict markets. We're trying to find wonderful businesses. And the fact that a part of the market is kind of screwy, uh, you know, that is, that, that's, that's unimportant to us. We, we tried a few times shorting some of those things in our, in our innocence of youth. And uh, it's very tough to make money shorting even the obvious frauds. And there are some, some obvious frauds. It really is. It's not tough to. It's not so tough to find the obvious frauds, and it's not tough to be right over ten years. But it's 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 very tough to make money uh, being short them. Although we tried a few times uh, way back, we really just focus on businesses. We don't we don't care if there's a stock market. I mean, would we want to own Coca Cola if they if they said they you know we're just going to delist the stock and we're never going you know we'll open it again in twenty years. It's fine with us, you know. And then if it goes down on the news, we'll buy more of it. So it we care about what the business does. It's ruined a lot of people. Uh, it's, it, it is the sort of thing that you can go broke doing. Being short something where your loss is unlimited is quite different than being long something uh, that, you, that you've already paid for. Uh, and it's tempting. You see way more stocks that are dramatically overvalued in your career, then you will see stocks that are dramatically undervalued. I mean, they're, they're, it's the nature of securities markets to occasionally promote various things to the sky so that securities will frequently sell for five or ten times what they're worth, and they will very, very seldom sell for 20% or 10% of what they're worth. So it, therefore, you see these much greater discrepancies between price and value uh, and on the overvaluation side. So you might think it's easier to make money on short selling. And all I can say is uh, uh, it hasn't been for me. I don't think it's been for Charlie. It is a very, very tough business because of the fact that you face unlimited losses and because of the fact that people that have overvalued stocks, very overvalued stocks, are fre frequently on some scale between promoter and crook. And that's why they get there. And once they're, and, and they also know how to use that very valuation to bootstrap value into the business because if you have a stock that's selling at 100 that's worth 10, obviously it's to your interest to go out and issue a whole lot of shares. And if you do that, when you get all through, the value can be 50. In fact, there's a lot of chain letter type stock promotions that are sort of based on the implicit assumption that the management will keep doing that. 
And if they do it once and build up to 50 by issuing a lot of shares at 100 when it's worth 10, now the, now the value is 50 and people say, well, these guys are so good at that, let's pay 200 for it or 300 and then they can do it again and so on. It's not usually that quite that clear in their minds, but that's, that's the basic principle underlying a lot of stock promotions. And if you get caught up in one of those that is successful, you can, you know, you can run out of money before the promoter runs out of ideas. It is very painful, and it's, it's in, our, in my experience, it's a whole lot easier to make money on, on, on the long side. I had one situation, actually an arbitrage situation, when I was in, well, it was when I moved to New York in 1954, so it was in about June or July of 1954, that involved a surefire type transaction, an arbitrage transaction, it had to work. But there was a technical wrinkle in it, and I was short something. And I felt like a, for, for a short period of time, I, uh, I, was, uh, I felt like uh, Finova was feeling last fall. I mean, it, uh, it was very unpleasant. Uh, it, you can't make, in my view, you can't make really big money doing it because you can't expose yourself to the loss that that uh, would be there if you did do it on a big scale. Well, Ben Franklin said if you want to be miserable, you know, during Easter or something like that, he says borrow a lot of money to be repaid at Lent or something to that effect. And similarly, being short something, which keeps going up, because somebody is promoting it in a half crooked way and you keep losing and they call on you for more margin. It, it just isn't worth it to have that much irritation in your life. Uh, it isn't that hard to make money somewhere else with less irritation. It would never work on a Berkshire scale anyway. I mean, you, you could never do it for the kind of money that, that uh, uh, would be necessary to do it with in order to have a real effect on Berkshire's overall value. So it, it's not something we think about. We're going to stay away from shorts at uh, Berkshire. Yeah, what makes common stock prices so hard to predict is that a, a general liquid market for common stocks creates from time to time, either in sectors of the market or in the whole market, uh, a Ponzi scheme. In other words, you have an automatic process where people get sucked in and other people come in because it worked last month or last year and, and it can build to perfectly ridiculous levels and the levels can last for considerable periods. That's what makes it so dangerous to short stocks even when they're grossly overvalued. It's hard to know just how overvalued they can become in addition to the overvaluation that exists. We have probably agreed on at least a hundred companies, maybe more, that we felt were, were frauds, you know, bubble type things. And if we'd acted on shorting those over the years, we might be broke now. But we were right on probably just about a hundred out of a hundred. It's just, it's very hard to predict how far what Charlie calls the Ponzi scheme will go. It's not exactly a scheme in the sense that it isn't concocted, for most cases, by, by one person. It, it's a sort of a natural phenomenon that seems to be nursed along by promoters and investment bankers and venture capitalists and so on. But it's, 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 it, they don't all sit in a room and work it out. It just, it, it plays on human nature in certain ways and it creates its own momentum and eventually it pops, you know, it, and nobody knows when it's going to pop. And that's why you can't short, at least we don't find it uh, uh, makes good sense to short those things. But they are, rec it is recognizable. You know when you're dealing with those kind of crazy things, but you don't know when, the, how high they'll go or when it'll end or anything else. All I can say is that uh, uh, I've, I've shorted stocks in my life and had one particularly harrowing experience in 1954. Uh, and. I have, can't, I can hardly think of a situation where I was wrong if viewed from 10 years later, but I can think of some ones where I was certainly wrong from the view of 10 weeks later, which happened to be the relevant period. And, 
and during which my net worth was evaporating and my liquid assets were getting less liquid and so on. So it's all I can tell you is very difficult. There was a book written in the late 60s, it had a lot of pictures in it. I don't remember the name of it, but it showed all these portraits of all these people that were highly successful in the hedge fund business, but they didn't bring out a second edition. Uh, so it, 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 it's just tough. I, I, logically, it should work well, but the, the math of only, you, you can't short a lot of something. You can buy till the cows come home if you got the money. You can buy the whole company if you but you can't short the whole company. Uh, it just takes one to kill you. And, and you need more and more money as the stock goes up. You don't need more and more money when a stock goes down if you paid for it originally and didn't buy it on margin. You just sit and find out whether you were right or not. But you can't necessarily sit and find out whether you're right on being short of stock. I don't care whether there's a thousand shares short of Berkshire or 300,000 shares short. It really doesn't make any difference because someday the people that are short have to buy and, you know, it, that, it's part of markets. We have no objection to anybody selling Berkshire short at all. Uh, the, uh, the more shorts, the better because they have to buy the stock later on. And some of our shareholders may make some money lending. We can't, Charlie and I can't do it, but, but there's nothing I would love better if it were legal than to lend my stock to shorts and have them pay me something for doing it. Uh, uh, I might want to get prepaid in certain cases. The, uh, there's nothing evil per se about, in my view, about selling things short. Um, I would say that it's a very, very tough way to make a living. It's not only often painful financially, it's very painful uh, emotionally because it, a stock that you sell short, a stock that you buy at 20 can go down 20 points and a stock that you sell short at 20 can go up an infinite amount and you don't think about that until you've gone short and it goes up about 10 or 15 points and then you don't sleep very well. So it's a, it's a very tough way to make a living. There are people on the short side that have done and that do things to try to make stocks go down, some of which are appropriate and some of which are inappropriate. There are people on the long side that have done the same exact, uh, the same sort of things go on. So I don't see any, I, I have no, uh, no ax to grind in the least against, against short sellers. And in terms of what they call naked shorting, which you, which means that you, you don't have the stock lined up to be borrowed, and maybe you have a whole bunch of fails to deliver and that sort of thing. Um, I don't have, I, I don't, I don't have a great, a, a great problem with that. If anybody wants to do that with Berkshire, you know, they, they, uh, more power to them. The situations in which there's been huge short interests, very often. Uh, very often have been later revealed to be uh, frauds or semi-frauds. Over the years, I probably had a hundred ideas of things that should be shorted. And I would say that almost every one of them have turned out to be correct. And I'll bet if I'd tried to do it and make money out of it, I probably would have lost money. I would have had no fun and the opportunity cost to Charlie say would have been enormous because if somebody's running something that's semi-fraudulent, they're probably pretty good at it, and they're working full-time at it, and uh, they've succeeded for a while, and they may keep succeeding, and if they succeed and you go in at X and it goes to 5X, you know, all you're hoping after a while is that it goes back to X again or something of the sort. It's a, it's a very tough psychological uh, game to play. A few people may be well-suited for it. Uh, I would never put any money with a short fund, but not because I would think it would be ethically wrong. I just think that they're unlikely to make money. Um, Charlie, do you have any thoughts on short selling or naked short selling? Well, I think you're absolutely right there in the sense that it's, that would be one of the most ir irritating experiences in the world to figure out something is crooked and foolish and so forth and then short it at X and have it go to 3X. Now you're watching all these happy crooks splashing around in your money while you're meeting margin calls. <laughs> Why would you want to go in hailing distance of an experience like that? I do not see the problem at all with 
with people shorting socks. I mean, I, I would welcome people shorting Berkshire Hathaway. I mean, it, it, uh, if you own stock and they need to borrow from you, you can get some extra income from your stock. And the one sure buyer of your stock eventually is somebody who shorted it. I mean, that guy's going to buy it someday. Uh, and I have no, I have no problem with, with shorts. If there's some kind of a game that's played, uh, uh, and I've read about it, I've never seen it happen to anything that we've owned. Uh, like I say, if anybody wants to naked short, Berkshire Hathaway, they can do it till the cows come home, and and we'll be uh, we'll be happy to, and we'll have a special meeting for them. Uh, but uh, and I, I would say this: the shorts generally have the tougher time of it in this world. I mean, there are more people bulling stocks for phony reasons than there are bearing stocks uh, for phony reasons. So I I do not see shorts as any great threat to the world. If, 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 if enough people shorted Berkshire stock, they would have to borrow it, and they would pay you to borrow your stock, and that's, just, that's found money. It's a tough way to make a living. Uh, uh, it's very easy to spot phony stocks and promoted stocks, but it's very hard to tell when that'll turn around. And, and uh, somebody that's promoted a stock to five times what it's worth may very well promote it to 10 times what it's worth, and if you're short, that can get very painful. I have no problem with, with short selling, and I have no problem with speaking out uh, responsibly about your reasons for doing so any more than I have on the, on the long side. Uh, there have been some very bad practices on the short side, and there have been some very bad practices on the long side in terms of people trying to, to uh, We'll really spread things that are untrue, but that there's probably been more on the long side over the years than on the short side by some margin. Yeah, we had a significant short position some years ago. Last year we had a small short position in two currencies, and we made about a hundred million dollars in them. But but we have not been really active in the foreign exchange market. We think uh, shouldn't speak for Charlie here on this, but I I think that that uh, there's no question that the purchasing power of the U.S. dollar will decline over time. The only question is at what rate, but I also think that the purchasing power of most currencies around the world, almost all currencies around the world, will decline. And, of course, a short position is just a bet on which one declines at, a, at the faster rate. And I don't have a strong conviction on that. I've got, I've got some mild feelings about it, but not enough to where I want to back it up with a lot of money. Inflation has not destroyed us. If somebody had said to me in 1930, in addition to this Great Depression you're facing in a world war where it looks like we're even losing for a little while and all of these terrible things, on top of that, that dollar that uh, you know your grandfather's going to hand you when you're born is only going to be worth six cents in purchasing power. That might have been discouraging, but overall, We've still done pretty well. So I hate inflation, but we've adapted pretty well to it uh, over the years, and we have not had the total runaway type inflation that, that really can be upsetting to a society yet, but I think it's something you always have to guard against. Charlie? No, but God knows where the world is headed. I just think that one way or another, the world muddles through. Adam Smith said it very well. He said, you know, a great civilization has a lot of ruin in it. It takes a long time, and there's a lot left after you've been through a good deal of ruin. In fact, it's an easier game than, than the ordinary process of living and then dying. Well, I think we'll see a lot of inflation, <laughs> but if, if I had a choice, you know, I would rather be born in the United States today than any other place, any other time in history. I don't know of people who I feel would have an edge in trying to do that over the next 10 years, but I do know people where I think they'd have a very significant edge in, in uh, investing in, in, in common stocks and maybe distressed bonds for that matter too.